Heritage Church. I'm Jeff Forster. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to thank Pastor Wesley for speaking last week. Didn't he do a good job? I thought he did just a, a great job. Uh, I was in uh, Burma, Myanmar, and we were working with a bunch of church planters there starting brand new churches. Uh, just a few years ago, that country opened up to be able to uh, bring Christianity to that country. And so we had a whole bunch of graduates. I spoke at a graduation ceremony. We did an ordination service, and then we went out deep into the country and uh, we're able to visit a number of churches that are doing well there. So uh, thank you, Wesley, for doing such a great job and for covering for us. And uh, we look forward to uh, moving through, finishing up today uh, with this Connect the Dots series. This is the last message, the final message in the Connect the Dots series. If you missed any of it, you can go online at experienceheritage.org and uh, you can check that out. Basically, what we try to do is tie the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, to Jesus. And, and uh, we showed how the overarching theme of the Bible and everything in it is pointing to Jesus. And so today, we're going to kind of button all that up. I'm going to kind of put it all back into one big uh, storyline, one narrative. And uh, I want to start by this. I want to ask you this question. Do you know, are you 100% sure of heaven? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? I can tell you this, that going to church doesn't get you to heaven. Uh, being born in America doesn't make you a Christian. Being born in a Christian family to Christian parents doesn't make you a Christian any more than being born in a garage makes you a car. Right? Being born in a donut shop doesn't make you a Krispy Kreme. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're only a Christian if your sins are completely forgiven by Jesus and his finished work on the cross. So the big question is, how can you know that your sins are forgiven? This is the gospel. It's what we're talking about. The, the word gospel comes from a, a Greek word, euangelion, and it's, it's the word that talks about good news announcements. This is what they would use, this word, is a word that they would use to announce a, a brand new emperor. A new emperor is born or whatever. A new leader, a new king. It's, a, it's good news, and they would go throughout the, the countryside and in the cities, and they, the proclaimers would proclaim those things. Hear ye, hear ye, kind of a thing, announcing the good news. And this is exactly what the angel did uh, for Mary and for Joseph uh, before Jesus was born. This is what the angels did when they came to the shepherds at that very first Christmas. They said it's good news for all the people, right? The angel told uh, Mary that his name is going to be Emmanuel, literally God with us, and he will save his people from their sins. This word euangelion is just good news, and that's the word that we call gospel. The gospel is good news, and the gospel changes everything. So here's what we did. In the notes today, uh, you'll notice G-O-S-P-E-L. That spells gospel. I'm smart enough to figure that out. It's in your notes. I'm going to help, you figure, uh, help you, give you a few things to help you remember what the gospel, according to the Bible, what it means, this good news, because from Genesis to Jesus, it's all good news. Now, not every single part is all that wonderful as far as good news, but the big picture of the Bible is the good news of God loving you and doing whatever it took to have a relationship with you for the rest of eternity. And so if you would, you want to fill in the first blanks here. God created us to be with him. God created us, you and me, to be with him. God made you a special creation so that you could have a relationship with him. You're not just some random cosmic dust. You're not some kind of uh, 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 mistake floating around on this little planet out in the middle of the universe. Uh, you, you were specifically made. God intentionally made you a special creation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when God made the first man and the first woman, he breath, breathed into them the breath of life, and they became a living soul. God said that I'm going to make them after my own image. Everything else that God created we, we already talked about this in Genesis chapter 1. If you missed it, go back and check out that message. But everything else God created, he spoke it into being. He spoke it. He just said it, and it happened. He said it, and it happened. But when it came to humanity, both men and women, he made us, physically formed us, specifically made you and me, apart from the animals. You are not some animal uh, on, roaming around on the third rock from the sun and having no purpose. God made you specific so that you could know him and have a relationship with him. Genesis chapter 1, the first words in the Bible just say, in the beginning God created. He created everything. He created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on and talks about how he, he made everything in order. We talked about that. And then he handcrafted humans. And he chose them to be his own family. He chose you to be in his family too. Here's what Ephesians chapter 1 says. Even before he made the world, 
when, when, even before, that's right, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I don't know when the last time uh, it crossed your mind that you have the ability to bring great pleasure to God. God loved you. God wanted you, and God made you. And before the world was ever formed, he planned for you to be in his family, and it put a smile on his face. He was thrilled to have you be able to be in his family. But we can get hung up on a couple of these words here that he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. And I think of myself, and I'm like, I'm not holy. I, I don't feel like I'm without fault. I know who I am. I know I've, hurt, I've done things to hurt myself. I've done things to hurt other people. And I don't always feel holy and without fault. But it, he's saying here that in Christ, I can be made clean again. I can be made holy again. I can be made without fault in his eyes when I'm in Christ. See, when I'm on my own, without Christ, I'm on my own and God sees me for who I am. But when the Bible says that when I uh, uh, throw off my old life and I repent of my sin and I turn to Christ, then he clothes me in his righteousness. Now, when God sees me, he sees Jesus, which was always his plan so that he could adopt us into his very own family. We get a new name. We get a new hope. We get a new future. I've told my, my story many times. My biological father was... Um, uh, life of the party, fun guy when he was sober. Uh, problem was he wasn't sober hardly ever. And um, he was very violent when he was uh, uh, drunk and he would beat us. He broke my mom's uh, jaw twice. He broke her nose three times. He broke all of her ribs. Uh, a number of years ago, she'd taken so many beatings, all of her skull is just fractures. And uh, her upper jaw fell off of her skull. They had to take out some teeth and screw her jaw back in, right? There's pretty bad beatings. He ran us both over the car. He pushed me down the stairs. He drew a gun on us. It was pretty crazy stuff. And then um, we ran away and we hid. And uh, it was a very violent time and a scary time for us. Finally, uh, he left us. Div divorce happened. And my mom and I uh, were alone. And we barely made it. And um, finally, after a number of years, she met the man that I call my dad, right? A anybody can be a father, but it takes a special man to be a daddy, right? And um, so uh, my dad, I can remember the day when we were standing in front of the judge and um, my dad had decided he wanted to adopt me. And um, every man in my biological father's side of the family, just about at that time in history, alcoholics in prison, killed a man, what somebody did, and one of my uncles, and uh, really rough life, beating their families. And then we have this new man, this good man in our family, and he wants to adopt me. And I remember standing in front of the judge, and I remember the judge saying, Jeffy, judges can call me Jeffy. You can't call me Jeffy, but say, Jeffy, is this what you want? And I, and I was like, yes. And I remember him saying uh, uh, along these lines, and I can remember the conversations being, this is irrevocable, right? This is a big decision for you to decide to adopt somebody else. And I can remember my dad getting down right in front of my face, and he said, Jeffy, I choose you. Everything changed. Talking about good news, everything changed. The trajectory of my life changed from that moment on. I had a brand new name. I don't have my old name. I have a new name. I don't have to go down the same path all the other men in my family had gone down up until that point. I had a new opportunity, a new direction. The Bible says before the world was ever created, God chose you. And he wanted to adopt you into his own family. This is God's plan all along. God never intended to have you be bound by religion. Jesus didn't come to bring you religion. Religion is always humanity's attempt to get to God. But God designed you to have a relationship with you, not just religion, a relationship. And this brought him great pleasure. So first of all, God created us to be with him. Number two, our sins separate us from God. Our sins separate us from God. This is bad news, right? So I told you I was going to tell you some good news. Don't worry, the good news is coming again. But in order to have good news, there has to be bad news. Otherwise, it's just all news. You know that, right? <laughs> so there's bad news and there's good news. And so I'm going to give you the bad news. Our sins separate us from God. If you've ever sinned, you're separated from God. One sin is enough. And, and people say, what is a sin? Sin is, is where we decide we want to be our own boss whether we're consciously doing it or we uh, uh, unconsciously do it. 
Uh, we, we don't want anybody telling us what to do. We're going to do our own thing. And oftentimes that means that we wind up uh, going against God's direction, the best way to live. I've told the story a, a number of times. When my daughter was little, she was three. She's 14 now. She was three. I sent the kids to bed. I said, hey, you guys, I want you to go to bed. And uh, she, they all, I thought, went to bed. And I was down in the family room. I was doing some work. I was watching ESPN. I was doing some work. And all of a sudden, I hear noise about a half hour later up in the living room. So I go up living room, see what's going on. And I grabbed one of those little tiny baseball bats to protect my family. And there's Jenna sitting there. She looked like Boo. Remember Boo from Monsters, Inc.? Little pigtails. She had the high-pitched voice and the big blue eyes. And uh, I said, what are you doing? And she looked at me so disgusted, three years old, so disgusted. She goes, I'm playing. <laughs> and I said, I sent you to bed a half an hour ago. And she said, you said you guys. So I have a three-year-old lawyer, right? That's what, I, that's what I've got sitting here. I'm like, oh, great. I said, you get your stuff together and you get up to bed right now. You know what I meant. And she says, why do you think you can tell me what to do all the time? I said, well, two reasons. One, because when mama's gone, daddy's the boss. That's, that's one. <laughs> and two... You weigh 30 pounds, and I weigh 200 and none of your business pounds. So you do what I say. That, that's, that's how it works. That's why God gave daddies to little girls. You get your stuff and go to bed. And she stood up, threw her toys down, put her hands on her hips, and says, I am so sick of you thinking you can tell me what to do around here all the time. <laughs> now, I know that I did not teach my daughter to not want a leader or a boss in her life. And I'm fairly certain my wife didn't have that conversation with her. It was just natural. She didn't want it, right? We had a board meeting. It was a unanimous decision. She decided to go to bed. But we are just born that way. We do what we want to do, regardless of contemplating what God would have for us. And so as a result, we wind up hurting ourselves. We wind up hurting others. We wind up rebelling against God. That's it. When I say that we're all sinners, I'm not saying that you're Hitler. I'm not saying that you went out and murdered a bunch of people. That's not what I'm saying. But we all are willful people and we do what we want to do. And sometimes that hurts ourselves and hurts other people, right? And we're separated from God because of it. If you've ever sinned, if you've ever broken one sin, one sin is enough to be separated from God. You break one part of the law, you're breaking the whole law, uh, the book of James says. It's kind of like a big glass window. If you throw a rock through that window, the whole window is broken. Even though it only went through this one part, the whole window is broken. The Bible says in the book of James that if you've broken any part of the law, you broke the whole law. You're no longer perfect. You're broken. And there's this yearning in humanity for everything to be fixed. We want everything to be perfect. Environmentalists want the planet to be perfect, and patriots want the government to be perfect, and married people want their marriage to be perfect, and parents want to figure out how to be better parents, and daters want to have better relationships, and students want better grades. It's just hardwired in us to be better, to do more. We, we know that perfection was there, and we've lost it. It's in us. We know. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That word fall short just means miss the mark. Uh, there was perfection. None of us have hit it. We've all missed the mark. And then there's a penalty for sin. There's a consequence for sin. For the wages of sin is death. The ransom for sin, the cost for sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so God made you to be with him. But our sins separate us from God. And sins cannot be removed by good deeds, if you're filling in the blanks. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. This is where religion comes in. Uh, I, I don't know if you have been. I've been in Buddhist temples. I've been in some of the largest mosques in the world. I've been in Hindu temples. I, I've been in most of the religious groupings around the world. I've, I've been a part of those things and studied. I've become kind of a student of the global religions. I was just in, at one of the holiest Buddhist sites last week uh, in, in the world. There's eight hairs from the Gautama Buddha that's in this place, and people come to worship, and 27 tons of gold, by the way. I was walking around with my knife just trying to scrape some. No, I'm joking. I wasn't trying to do that. 27 tons of gold in this place, and all these idols everywhere, thousands of Buddhas all around, and people are, are, are praying, and the monks are there praying, and they're pouring water offerings over the Buddhas and giving money, all these things. And I saw this uh, father with this little boy, he's about this big, 
and uh, the father was trying to point to the Buddha, and then he gets down on his knees, and he, he explains to the boy that we're going to pray, and the little boy's just all excited because there's so many things going on, and then finally the little boy closes his eyes, and he's looking to his dad, trying to get some guidance on what to say, what to pray. Buddhism is a, is a religion that is based on a belief system. It's not really, it's a religion kind of, but a belief system that's built around the idea that all life is suffering and that uh, the goal is to get to enlightenment and enlightenment basically is embracing the idea of suffering and everything is suffering and then we throw off all desire, all pleasure. We throw away, uh, throw off everything, all of our attachments. We're not attached to things. We're not attached to people anymore. So I would agree there's a lot of suffering in life, but man, alive. There's a lot of beautiful things in life that God has given us as well. So to throw that all off is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly sad. But So the idea is karma then. Good things outweigh the bad things. And so we keep doing more and more good things so we can get in. Hinduism has the karma idea in it as well. Islam has the idea of of putting good deeds out in front to finally appease uh, a God that is otherwise going to judge us. Religion is man's attempt to get to God, and we're always trying to find a way to have enough good deeds to balance it out. Most people in America have a concept uh, of, of, this, uh, of, this con- of this idea of trying to do good deeds in order to please God enough to finally balance out the scales. Like there's this great cosmic scale in heaven and uh, here's all my bad deeds on this one side, you know, back when we were in the fraternity in college. You know what I'm talking about. And then you spend the rest of your growing up years trying to balance that out and get more good deeds than bad deeds so that God finally is appeased and you don't have to pay the consequences anymore. But the Bible is really clear on this. Doing good deeds in order to outweigh your sins is a lot like putting new frosting on a burnt cake, right? It only fixes the outside. It doesn't fix it. Jesus is the one who fixes it, and this is the good news. This is the gospel. God saved you, Ephesians chapter 2 says. God saved you by his grace when you believed. Grace is God choosing to give you what you don't necessarily deserve, and you receive that when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. God just offers it to you as a gift. Not as something you earn. You don't earn gifts. You're given gifts. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Would you underline that phrase for me in your notes? Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Would you read that out loud with me? Just that one phrase. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. You understand that? I didn't say that. I didn't make it up. It's what the Bible tells us. This is the good news. All the rest of religion is trying to appease God, make God finally happy with us, or finally just get rid of all attachments so that we can reach nirvana. The gospel is exactly the opposite. God made you to know him. God made you to enjoy life. God made you to enjoy the love of the people around you. God made you to fulfill your purpose in life. But there's this sin that separates us. And so God says, let me solve that for you. And I'll solve it and give it to you as a free gift. It's yours, no cost to you. It's cost to him. It's incredibly expensive to God, but not to you. And he gives it to you. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. There's not enough karma you can build up in your life to earn forgiveness of your sins. God is good, and he gives you and me what we don't deserve, grace, and we just receive it by believing. Jesus washes away our sin, and he gives us new life. Look what it says in Titus chapter three. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Mercy is God not giving me what I do deserve. So grace is God giving me what I don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving me what I do deserve. So he he did this not because I had done good things, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. And he generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight, and he gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is what God tells us. So sins cannot be removed by good deeds. We've got this issue because we know that we're sinners. Jesus steps in, number four, paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose again. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. We talked a little bit about the fact that God had, uh, when humanity sinned, God had shown them the idea of a sacrifice being able to cover over their sin. 
multiple times through the Old Testament, God says, I don't want more sacrifices. The sacrifice is only to show you that there's a consequence to sin. Sin always leads to death. He was pointing to the sacrifice that would come, the Messiah. John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was that Lamb who would come and be the ultimate sacrifice for humanity. How does this work, right? People know that verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Why in the world would God give his Son? The Bible teaches that God is three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three unique personalities, one God. So the Bible says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible expression of a God we cannot see. Does that make sense? Jesus was was God in the flesh. Look, Look what it says here. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. So when, it, when the Bible calls Jesus the Son of God, Jesus was born as a human being at Christmas. That's why we celebrate that at Christmas. He is the visible image of the invisible God. And him being born as a human then uh, identifies him. This is the human version of God. God became a man. So the Bible refers to him as the Son of God. So because God is the one who came to pay the price for my sin, it makes it possible for all of my sin to be forgiven because he never owed the debt. God was the one who made the rule, if you sin, you die. You're eternally separated from me. But then God says, but let me step in your place and I'll pay that price for you. Look what 1 Peter says. He said, Christ suffered for our sin once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. You see how often the Bible uses family type words. It doesn't say that he can, so that he can uh, finally set you free so you can be his slave for the rest of your life, right? It it doesn't say that. It says that so that he could bring you safely home to God. So when I look at all these other religions, these people that uh, 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 around the world that uh, God's given me the opportunity to do ministry with and train other pastors in other countries, and I meet the the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims and the 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 uh, uh, the Taoists and all, all the others around the world, the atheists, I don't look down on them. I don't. I'm not like, oh, I'm so glad I'm so holy and they're so rotten and horrible. It's exactly the opposite. I look upon every person who doesn't know, yet know the name of Jesus, and my heart breaks for the things that break the heart of God. God desperately wants a relationship with them, too. They may or may not know yet. I want them to know that Jesus suffered so that they don't have to. Jesus suffered so that you don't have to. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. And so paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. And then here's the good news. That's good news. And then to continue the good news, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. It's tempting sometimes to find out this good offer. What an extraordinarily good offer. This good news that God will forgive my sins and give me hope for eternity. He'll forgive my past and give me power for living today. How great is that? So I'll just grab Jesus and put him on the shelf alongside of all my other gods because I've got all kinds of gods that are really important to me. I was in a a village in the Himalayas and we were, again, working with some church planters. And there's this young woman, she's 20 years old. Uh, uh, She became a Christian about 18 months before we met her. And uh, the, 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 the couple, the man and woman who led her to Christ, uh, they were like, you got to see what she's doing. And so she rides a bus about three and a half hours out from Kathmandu to the, the base of the mountains where she had grown up. And then she hitchhikes up the mountain for about three or four hours on, on Friday afternoon after she gets done. She's a university student. And so it takes her about six or seven hours to get home. And then along the ridge at about 11, 12,000 feet, uh, there's all these little villages of 70 or 100 people, something like that. And uh, she has relatives in a few of them, and she led several of them to Jesus. And then she started these little churches in their homes. And so she has these 10 groups, about, uh, I would guess, 200 Christians meeting. And so uh, all weekend long, she goes from church to church, and she encourages them and challenges them, and she helps teach them the Bible. And then she hitchhikes down the mountain, catches the bus, rides back in just in time to go to school back on Monday. And uh, what an extraordinary thing. So I'm sitting in the village, and uh, maybe there were 75 people in the whole village. It was just a little flat spot, uh, literally hanging off the side of the mountain. And uh, uh, the whole village had been Hindu about a year before, and um, 
there's a lot of fear. I don't know. There's a lot of demons and things like that in the in, in that version, their version of Hinduism. And so there was a lot of fear and a lot of magic and that kind of stuff. And uh, I, we were sitting in the home of one of the, the leaders there who had become a Christian. And I asked her, I said, uh, I asked him, it was a gentleman. I asked him, and I said, what, <clears throat> Hindus have 35 million gods. So to add another God is no problem. Oh, Jesus, great. We'll put him on the shelf too. And so I asked him, I said, so uh, tell me about when you trusted Jesus. And he began to explain how he came to faith in Christ, how this young woman came and showed that his sins could be forgiven, not because of what he did trying to appease an angry God, but he found out that God loves you and that God loves him and that God came and paid the price for uh, him. And so all he had to do was receive it by faith. And it was an amazing story to hear him tell us. I said, well, what did you do with all of your other gods? Right? You had a lot of other gods. What did you do with all of your other gods? And he shook his finger like this. And he said, it's all Jesus or no Jesus. Right? That, That was it. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. This permanent relationship with God can never be broken by you and will never be broken by him. He says this, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God or not that we appeased God or not that we put up enough karma to make God happy with us. Not that we have done enough or paid enough or gone far enough. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Jesus said it in John 14, 6. He said, Jesus told him, I am the way and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I'm the way. The life that you're looking for. You don't have to annihilate yourself. You don't have to pull yourself away from life. You don't have to get rid of all of your joys and all of those things in order to finally be freed from pain. Jesus says, I'm the way to be freed from pain. I'm the truth that you're really looking for, the enlightenment that you're seeking. And Jesus said, I'm the life that you really were meant to live all along. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. In Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 4, he says, There's no, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There's no other way. The good news is this, John chapter 1. But to all who believed him, to all who accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Not slaves of God, not servants of God. He gave you the right to become children of God. God made you to have a relationship with you. God did not make you for religion. He made you for a relationship. It's not about trying. Religion is all about trying. That's the way of Islam. That's the way of Buddhism. That's the way of Mormonism. That's the way of Hinduism. That's the way of religion. It's not about trying. It's about believing and receiving Christ. And then he will never let you go. Once you've put your hand in his, he will never let you go. That's not a license to sin. That's a license to serve him. That's a license to live your life for him. That's a license to become everything that God made you to be and to accomplish everything that he made you to do. When you cross that line, when you say, I'm going to stop trying and I'm just going to start believing by faith, Jesus, I'm going to receive this gift that you're offering me, especially at Christmas season, the Bible says that life with Jesus starts now and it lasts forever. It starts right now, that moment that you cross that line of faith, that you receive the free gift that he paid for you on the cross, that moment life begins now and lasts forever. Jesus is talking to the Father before he goes to the cross. And he says, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. And then Jesus said, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. That's what he did on the cross. You see, God said that the penalty for sin is death. And then God became a man in the person of Christ Jesus. And Jesus lived a sinless life. He didn't owe the death penalty, but he winds up coming to the cross willfully. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that nobody took Jesus' life for him. He willingly laid it down. They didn't have to wrestle Jesus to the cross. Jesus went to the cross. He gave his life. They didn't take his life. And then on the cross, they're nailing him to the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus forgives one of the, you know, everybody has a, has a choice. One of the thieves that were nailed on the cross next to him mocked Jesus the whole time. But one of them said, Jesus, you don't belong here. I do. Would you remember me when you arrive in paradise? And Jesus said, today, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
he forgives this man of his sins. And then comes to the end. <clears throat> the Bible says that Jesus shouts out, it is finished. Tetelestai, literally, it's paid in full. Jesus had completed the mission that he came for, and that was to purchase you with his own life so that you could be his sons and daughters, so that you could be a part of his family again, to restore what was broken. The Bible said at that point then, this curtain that was in the temple that separated God from humanity was torn from the top to the bottom. It was torn from the top down. God says, no more is there a separation between us. From this point on, for everybody who becomes a follower of Jesus, you now are a temple of God. You carry God in you, not just that you can go and worship God somewhere. You carry God with you. So that means that you don't come to church. You are the church, right? You don't come and worship God. Your life worships God. We come together to celebrate together and encourage one another, but you represent God if you're a follower of Jesus everywhere you go all the time because God is always with you, which winds up making me check myself sometimes with the lifestyle I'm choosing to live. If I had Jesus sitting right there next to me, would I go ahead and drink the fifth one? Would I keep looking at her as she walks by? If I knew Jesus was sitting right there, would I make Jesus do those things? So now I don't choose to live a decent life. I don't choose to walk away from things that aren't good for me in order to try to get to heaven or please God. Instead now, I, I do those things. I step away from those things because I want to honor God with my life. With all that he did for me, why wouldn't I give the best version of me back to him? I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I'm free to go and be whatever I want to be, but God set me free to be his and to live for him and to be the best version of me for the rest of my life. Because he has a purpose for me. He has a purpose for you. He's got a plan for you. And God set you free so you can fulfill that plan. If you've accepted Jesus in your life. The good news of the gospel changed everything. If it hadn't been for the gospel, I don't know where I would be at this point in my life. I think about that a lot. There's been some good things that have happened on my biological father's side. The family. And, and, and you know, God does amazing things. But who knows where I would have been? I have a sense in jail. I have a sense perhaps that I would have been abusive to my family too, maybe dead. I don't know. But Jesus and his love, literally the gospel changed everything for me. And the gospel can change everything for you too. The good news of the gospel can make a difference in your life starting today and lasting forever. So the big question is, what's holding you back? Why not at Christmas? Why wouldn't you just receive the free gift that God's offering to you? It doesn't cost you anything. It costs God everything. God determined that he'd rather die than live through eternity without you. He's willing to do whatever it took, and then he offers it as a free gift. The old you can be gone. The brand new you can begin today. The good news of the gospel can make a difference in your life just like it did in mine. You can be invited into God's family today and it'll last forever. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you love us and that you made us to have a relationship with you and that before the world ever began, it brought you great pleasure to think about us and to set the plans forth to make it possible to adopt us into your own family. And from that day forward, we had the opportunity to have a new name and a new future. We didn't have to keep going down the same path. You transform us and make us new the day you adopted us into your own family. And the way you do that, you don't force it on us. You offer it as a free gift. It's up to us to receive it. And so, God, for those that are in the room that received your free gift, we celebrate you again at this Christmas season, and we just feel compelled to tell everybody and invite everybody in on this incredible, extraordinary gift of a relationship with you through what Jesus did for us on the cross. Help us not to waste this Christmas season, but to spread your love far and wide to everybody who's desperate to hear it, here locally and around the world. For some in the room, you say, you know what, Jeff? Today's my day. That's what I need. I need Jesus in my life. I need to experience God's forgiveness in my life. I, 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 I need to receive him so I can be adopted into his very own family, so I can become everything that God made me to be. If that's you, maybe you pray a prayer like this. It's not the words, it's what's in your heart, but I'll, I'll kind of give you some guidance as to maybe what to say. Maybe you'd say, God, I live my life my own way. I know I'm a sinner. 
but I believe that Jesus died and rose again so that my sins could be forgiven, the price could be paid. And so today's my day. Jesus, I open my life to you and I invite you in. Come in and be the Lord of my life. Wash away my past. Give me hope for the future. Give me power to be everything you made me to be today. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me.